Well, welcome to our four o'clock press conference. This press conference is about Superstorm Sandy, black swan cyclones, and the economic toll to come. We have three speakers today. Our first speaker will be Hillary Stockton, research oceanographer with the U.S. Geological Survey in St. Petersburg, Florida. Next speaking will be Ning Lin. She's assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at Princeton University in Princeton, New Jersey. And our third speaker is Dylan McNamara. He's assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Physical Oceanography at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. Good afternoon. The USGS is, played a large role in Sandy in predicting how the coast was going to respond to the storm and also in data collection efforts before and after the storm made landfall. On the screen here, you can see two sets of pre- and post-storm photography collected by the USGS. In the lower right is a picture you've probably seen a lot after this storm. It's Seaside Heights, New Jersey, and you can see large extents of sand covering the roads, and this is called overwash. It may look shocking, but this really is the natural response of a barrier island to storms. The um, pictures on your left are from Assateague Island in Maryland. The top picture is from uh, 2009, and the bottom picture is, was taken after Sandy. In this picture, you can see a large overwash fan, or sand covering the road, um, excuse me, covering the island. And this is how a barrier island responds to rising seas. During storms, storm surge and large waves will transport sand from the ocean side back to the sound side or bay side. This, in essence, translates the footprint of the island landward, moving it to a higher elevation, and also raises the core a little bit, making it more resilient. What I like about both of these images is that you can see the overwash fans as this island tries to, to keep pace with rising seas. This same process happens on developed barrier islands as well. However, when you uh, put a coastal community down on the island, it prevents the natural response of the barrier. And now overwash is a coastal change hazard. Because we know how storms respond to uh, excuse me, because we know how barrier islands respond to storms, we can predict the general response to future storms. Shown here are some results from a USGS model of the probability or likelihood of three different types of coastal change to Hurricane Sandy. This is for a stretch of the south shore of Long Island called Fire Island National Seashore. And the three bands are indicating the probability of beach and dune erosion, overwash or the landward transport of sediment, and then inundation, which is when the barrier island or beach goes underwater. Red is bad. Red is 100% likelihood of that type of change occurring. White means 0% chance. And what uh, you can see here is for the entire stretch of the coastline of Fire Island, is it likely to experience, very likely to experience beach and dune erosion. There is much more variability in overwash, and the more red areas, the more vulnerable areas, are those with lower beach elevations. The lowest elevation you can see there with the 61% chance of inundation or breaching is uh, one of the lowest points along this island. And in fact, this area did breach during Hurricane Sandy. The picture on the top left is NOAA vertical photography, and you can see a inlet there that has cut the island in half. Okay. USGS went out, as I mentioned before, to collect data on how the coast responded to Hurricane Sandy. On the left is another set of pre and post storm photography. This is from the same area where I showed you we predicted uh, the island was likely to breach. And on the right are elevation maps that were made using LIDAR, which is a laser that measures the elevation of a beach. And the top is the elevations of this stretch of coastline before Hurricane Sandy, 
And the reds and yellows are the higher elevations here outlining the, the dune crest. The middle image is the elevations of the beach after Sandy, and you can see that the inlet has been cut through the island. And when we difference these two images, you get a map of the change that occurred, and that's the bottom image. The blues are accretion or gains in sediment, and reds are losses. You can see the, along the bay side of the island, the light blue indicates about a meter of accretion or island growth, and that's due to overwash of this natural area moving landward. These losses came from the front of the island, where you can see anywhere from one to three meters of vertical sand loss. This, this vertical loss actually makes the beach more vulnerable to future storms. These are the same predictions that I showed you before. On the top right, this is the vulnerability of Sandy, um, excuse me, of Fire Island to Hurricane Sandy. And we estimated that about 20% of this island was very likely or likely to go be overwashed during Sandy. We went back to the island and measured the heights of the dunes, the elevation of the beach after Sandy, and then redid our analysis. And this time, 70% of the island is likely to overwash in conditions similar to Sandy. What's also important to point out is that this, these losses of elevation on the beach make coastal communities more vulnerable to lesser storms in the future. Hello everyone. Um, so we would like to talk about our recent work on black swan tropical cyclones. Um, a black swan is a surprise um, with huge impact. Um, so for the purpose of this study, we define a black swan as an event that cannot reason reasonably be uh, anticipated based on historical records alone. Um, so um, basically, most uh, hurricane risk assessment um, are based on historical records, which, is, um, which are often limited to a few hundred years at most. Um, so um, stronger hurricanes um, are yet to happen um, in the future um, at places that have, not been, uh, that have not been affected historically. Um, such extreme events um, lay outside uh, of the ring of the um, historically based expectations and they carry extreme impacts. Um, so the first question you may have is, um, was Sandy a black swan? Um, Sandy produced the highest water level at uh, recorded highest water level at Battery in New York City um, of about 3.5 meters. But the high tide contributed about 0.8 meters. So the surge was about 2.75 meters, which is much lower than the surge produced by a hurricane in 1821 um, in New York City, uh, hitting New York City at low tide. So in terms of storm surge, Sandy was not a black swan. Um, Sandy was not a black swan also because we have already shown in our previous publications in 2010 and 2012 um, that extreme surges up to five meters um, are possible for New York City. Um, the probabilities of such extremes are extremely low, but um, in our uh, synthetic catalogs, we can also show that there are many uh, synthetic storms that can generate storm surges greater than the level of um, storm surge induced by Hurricane Sandy. So how can we um, investigate, how can we um, predict or fund or search such extreme events or black swans? Um, since we cannot rely on the limited historical data, we apply physically based uh, storm surge risk assessment. So first, we apply a deterministic um, and statistical hurricane model developed by Emmanuel and others to generate large numbers of synthetic storms for the area of interest. 
This model does not rely on the limited historical data, but it is driven by the large scale storm environmental conditions. So we can generate large numbers of synthetic storms and physically possible storms uh, for different climate conditions. And then we carry out uh, storm surge simulations using synthetic storms, uh, synthetic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, using um, hydrodynamic models for these synthetic storms. So we got a large uh, number of storms and large database, then we can search for black swans in terms of the search level. Um, so, and we can also carry out statistical analysis to estimate the probabilities for such black swans. Um, so we're using this method to search for black swans all over the world. Um, for example, we have been carrying out um, uh, uh, studies for Tampa, which is located on the central west Florida coast. So Tampa is highly vulnerable to storm surge due to its geophysical features. It is surrounded by uh, low-lying lands and affected by coastally, coastally captured cap cabin waves, which can greatly enhance the water level in Tampa Bay. Um, historically, the, the highest water level recorded in Tampa was due to a hurricane um, in 19th century, uh, induced a storm surge of about 4.6 meters. But black swans in a large database shows that storm surge greater than 10 meters are possible for Tampa. Although, again, probabilities for such ex extreme events are extremely low, but that's not zero, and they are possible. Um, so we also been looking at um, um, possible black swans in other areas such as Person Gulf um, and uh, Darwin in Australia. And uh, we do find some extremes that people may not be able to anticipate based on historical records. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Uh, these PCs, I don't have any idea how you work this thing. Can you, how do you, you just double click on this thing? There we go. And then what do you do? Uh, I'm flummoxed, full screen mode. Okay. So I'm sure many of you are potentially have some personal familiarity with uh, the housing bubble, the recent bursting of the housing bubble. Um, a, a sort of semi-formal def definition of a bubble is that an asset gets overvalued relative to what you would consider it, its fundamental value to be. So what my research explores, or, or what I'm going to be talking about at AGU this week is, oh, is the following. So what I've done here is I've taken a picture. That's the, that town right there is a town called Ocean City. It's the town that I grew up in. It's a town along the east coast of Maryland. And my research explores whether or not coastal properties in towns such as Ocean City or, or towns along the coast of New Jersey, whether or not those locations have the potential to be a bubble in this somewhat of the same sense that the housing bubble was. More specifically, and what I'm interested in exploring is the role that sea level rise, changing rates of sea level rise, and changing storminess play in altering the manifestation of that bubble and altering whether or not that bubble will burst and what the time scale for the bursting of that bubble may be. So as I just described, sea level rise and storm climate play an important role, but and I'm, I'm interested in sort of investigating this more, what I'm terming a morpho-economic bubble in coastal property value. So unlike the housing bubble, this is a bubble that is not just economic in nature. You can't really consider the bubble characteristics of coastal property without carefully considering the morphology as well. And to give you an idea what I mean when I say that, this is a slide that sort of shows the, con the extent to which the human occupied coastline is a tightly coupled system. So you have these natural coastal dynamics that evolve and play out. And those coastal dynamics influence the economy through storms that occur, processes of erosion, 
and not only the actual processes themselves, but people's expectations of how those processes might play out in the future. Those impact the coastal economy, the coastal economy evolves, and then it drives changes to the, the natural coastline. It drives changes in the position of the coastline through beach nourishment, for example, the increasing of dunes along the coastline, or maybe the construction of seawalls. And so then outside of that system, that coupled human economic system, the system is forced by climate change, which is something that a lot of us spend a considerable amount of time thinking about, you know, changing rates of sea level rise, changing storminess. But not only is it influenced by forces from the outside that are physical, but it's influenced by forces from the outside that are economic as well. For example, government subsidies. Um, what I'm going to talk about explicitly is the fact that the government subsidizes beach nourishment. They have historically subsidized beach nourishment to the tune of about 65 percent, which means that when coastal communities decide that they've suffered storms or they want to enhance their recreational value of their beachfront, they take sand from offshore places and put it on the fronting shoreline to increase the aerial extent of the beach. The cost to do that has historically been subsidized at 65 percent by the government. I'm interested in kind of exploring what might happen if that subsidy were to change. There's already those wheels are turning that the subsidy is slowly being removed from these coastal economies. And so in exploring these things, I've created uh, quantitative numerical models that sort of capture all of these dynamics that I just described. And what I'm talking about this week, actually, are two different types of models without going into the detail of what those models involve. But they're sort of two entirely different approaches to capture all of these dynamics. One I'm terming a dynamic model, one I'm terming an equilibrium model. The details of those models aren't necessarily important. Um, but I can show you some of the results from the modeling work with respect to this issue of a government subsidy. So for, as I mentioned before, historically the cost of beach nourishment has been subsidized at about 66 percent. And so because of the human occupied coastline nourishment, you, you cannot consider, effectively you cannot consider property value without considering the role that nourishment plays in creating that property value. So it begs the question, if that subsidy were to be removed, would it create an economic or morpho-economic bubble in this case? So both models suggest that it would. Here are plots that show, on both plots, the left-hand vertical axis is the fractional reduction in property value with the loss of government subsidy of nourishment. On the horizontal axis in both plots are effectively sea level rise. There, there, it's, sea level rise is handled slightly differently in the two models, but one, it's the vertical rise of sea level, one's the erosion due from sea level rise. But in any case, it's the, it's the effect or the impact of, of sea level rise. The red curve is if the sediment that people use to nourish the beach is twice as costly as it is today, which is something that most people would anticipate is going to occur. The gray curve is the current cost of sediment that you use to nourish the beach. And so what this shows is that, you know, in the worst case scenarios for both models, if we have uh, you know, really uh, rapid rates of sea level rise, upwards of 10 millimeters per year, the fractional reduction in property value can get as high as 40 percent. So that means that the moment the government says we are going to remove the subsidy for nourishment, property values will drop by 40 percent. Now this won't happen in a day. It will take some time for the market to sort of unwind this position, but the fundamental value of coastal property will reduce dramatically. And so this is the hallmark of, of a bubble. The other thing that I've explored in these plots are the differences between the dashed and the solid curves. The dashed curve is a, new, is a storm climate that's comparable to what you would find in New Jersey, and the solid versions of each of the lines are storm climates comparable to what you would see in North Carolina. And one of the interesting things that's coming out of this work is that in one case you can see that the storm climate plays a significant role in altering the size of the bubble, in the other case it does not. A couple other questions uh, that, are, that, that are sort of related to this. That dynamic model effectively plays the whole scenario out all the way until the time when economic investors in the model decide that they are no longer worth to property, so they abandon these coastal locations. So what can we learn as this abandonment plays out in that model? 
more specifically, so if you consider the government subsidy, the loss of that government subsidy, what role does that play in hastening the amount of time till abandonment relative to increasing rates of sea level rise? How do those two things compare in changing the amount of time it occurs until abandonment? And then finally, can we see some indications before abandonment occurs, some precursor signals that suggest that abandonment is right around the corner? So with respect to the subsidy and sea level rise, this is a contour plot. So on the vertical axis is the rate of sea level rise. On the horizontal axis is the nourishment subsidy that occurs from the government. And the colors correspond to the number of years until abandonment occurs in these simulations. And so what you can see is that as you march from left to right in the plot, the more the government subsidizes, the more they increase the amount of time until the coastal property market gets abandoned. And then if you go vertically, the same thing. As you increase the rate of sea level rise, you, or the reverse, sorry. As you increase the rate of sea level rise, you hasten the amount of time to abandonment. But what's interesting is that removal of a government subsidy has as much of an impact, almost as much of an impact, as changing rates of sea level rise in altering the amount of time it takes until coastal properties are completely abandoned. And then finally, this is a plot that sort of shows, you know, in economics, one thing that you expect before a bubble burst is an increase in volatility. Stocks get traded rapidly in large volumes. And so what I've done here in that simulation is to measure the volatility in the coastal real estate on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, that's the years before abandonment occurs in the model. And so what this shows is that as you head towards abandonment, which occurs in this case at time zero, there is a dramatic increase in the real estate volatility. As people are becoming aware of how precarious their positions are in these coastlines, there's a lot of buying and selling of homes going on right at these la in these last few years before people decide eventually that they're going to abandon these coastal properties. So with respect to Sandy, you know, I, I sort of, the metaphor that I, I use, Sandy I view as, as sort of a gun going off, and I don't necessarily explore in fine detail the gun going off, the questions I'm more interested in asking, how did the gun get loaded? And so watching these things play out over a long period of time is getting at those kinds of questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, time to go on to questions. Do we have any questions? Brian? Uh, Brian Vastag, Washington Post. So out, out in Ocean City, where you grew up, um, mm -hmm. are, are, is there any way to try to validate this? You know, I understand what you're trying to do with this model, but how do you try to match it to you know, what's going on in the real world? So that's actually a, a great question, and it, the answer to it is different for the two different modeling approaches I've used. Um, the more traditional modeling approach that I use is, has a very strong empirical foundation. So, so the sort of the equations that we use are, are rooted in economists having gone out and figured out things like, how much does beach width actually play a role in coastal property value? What is the equation that connects beach width to property value? And so we use those, those specific forms in that modeling approach. So all of the ingredients that go into it in that case are pretty well vetted in, in data. The dynamic approach is a little bit more, there's data yet to be collected to validate or, or to constrain the things that go into that model. Um, so I feel pretty good about the ingredients that go into the traditional model with respect to their influence on property values. And so when you remove those government subsidies, um, that's something that we haven't seen play out yet, so I can't necessarily match that to data yet. But everything else up until there seems to jive with what you actually see in Ocean City. Yeah, so when I said 60, 65 percent, that was everything that didn't come from, in that case, Ocean City proper, for example. So state and federal, yeah. Um, Rick Lovett, freelance. This is for Dr. Lynn. Um, the when you say unlikely, but uh, when your probabilities for those giant storm surges, how low when you say unlikely were they? Um, so for the for the extremes like um, five meters of surge in New York City, we're talking about one over um, ten thousand. And for Tampa Bay. Um, almost similar like that. Okay, and one final thing. Did you say Persian Gulf for storms? 
Yeah. yeah. Can you explain that? I didn't you know what type of storms you're talking about. Um, also, like black swans, if you look at the historical records, there were no storms in Persian Gulf. So if you estimate what's going to happen in the future based on historical events, that's zero. But uh, uh, physically, um, it's possible to have storms generated in Persian Gulf because the water there is really uh, is very shallow and hot. So it's uh, sufficient to sustain uh, severe tropical cyclones. In our simulations, we do have, um, we do simulate, uh, have many uh, st synthetic storms that generate or move into Persian Gulf and make landfall in um, highly populated uh, cities like Dubai and generate surges uh, greater than five meters. So uh, we know that Dubai may have uh, even difficulties to deal with heavy rainfall flooding. So. Um, they probably haven't really thought about um, uh, coastal flooding risk. Uh, hi, it's Ken Chen, New York Times, uh, for Dr. McManero. Um, what is, how vast an area are you looking at, that you're defining as coastal, um, that you think looks like it's going to be abandoned in a century or two? I mean, does it include places like Lower Manhattan? Lower Manhattan's not, the, this, the, the dynamics that I've simulated and the models that I've presented don't necessarily apply to lower Manhattan. Those apply more to your classic coastal tourist resort town on a barrier island. And have you looked at how much area you're looking, you're looking at on the east coast that is going to be abandoned? Not, well, again, so those simulations that I showed are suggestive of locations up and down the coast of North Carolina Ocean City, Maryland, New Jersey, environments like that, the, the physical environments that have been characterized in those models are similar to what you would find along the coast of New Jersey, Maryland, North Carolina. Okay. My question, uh, this is Becky Oskin from Our Amazing Planet. My question is for Dr. Lin. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned Hurricane Katrina in your abstract for the presentation, so I was wondering, where you think that lies as an unusual event? Is that a black swan? And then I would also like to ask you to follow up with talking a little bit more about the models that you're basing this on, because um, some of the models that you and your colleagues have um, put out in the last few years have been somewhat controversial based on um, the fact that they've incorporated some predictions of global warming and pollution and climate change. So could you tell me a little bit more about some of the models that you're using for making these projections of extreme events? Right. So first question, Hurricane Katrina. We didn't mention about Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we mentioned about Um, okay, that's in my talk. Okay. <laughs> I didn't talk about here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, um, some people say it was unexpected, Katrina was a black swan, but some people say it was um, predicted, saying the levee was uh, not sufficient, was, was going to fail someday. So in that sense, it was predicted. Um, so I would, I would, um, I would think uh, if we do simulation for the Gulf from Mexico, we can find much higher uh, surges that possible for that area. In other words, we can find black swans that's greater, generally surges greater than the, the level of uh, Katrina. Um, so the second <coughs> question was about the model we're using. Um, so I mentioned we use the uh, um, um, statistical deterministic hurricane model developed by Emmanuel and others uh, to generate storms under different climate conditions. So this model is um, used by National Hurricane Center as one of the um, models to predict storms in real time making forecasts. Um, so it's a relatively simple model compared to the weather forecasting model, but it captures the physics of the storms. Um, so, and it can run very fast to generate large numbers, uh, which is needed for the, this study to capture the extremes. Um, so I'm not sure about what you mean by the controversial about the model. 
No, okay. it's nothing to do with pollution. Okay, it's a, so just it's not the one. That, model. It's not the one that was published in 2006, having to do with pollution being linked to hurricane variability. No, so okay. the, the 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 model was really published in 2006, but yeah. nothing to do with pollution. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so we have a couple of questions from the internet. Hi, this first question is from Millie Dry with National Geographic News. I'm sure the speakers are familiar with the hurricane of 1938 that struck Long Island. Would that be considered a black swan storm? Also, I'm curious about whether Hurricane Hazel in 1954 would be considered a black swan storm. It was also something of a freak because it maintained a category four strength all the way to North Carolina, which was very unusual. The 1938 hurricane, I believe, was category three storm even more unusual for Long Island. That's why I'm wondering whether these are considered black swan storms. Um, when we say uh, black swan in specific this case, we're talking about the search level at particular location. So I focus on New York City rather than Long Island. So for New York City, the 1938 um, storm was, didn't generate the, the surges greater than the 8021. So we don't consider black swan for New York City, but it may be for New Long Island, but I haven't looked at Long Island. Okay, the second question is from Seth Bornstein at the Associated Press for Dr. Lin. If a New York City black swan is five meters and a Tampa one is 10 meters, can you give us what would be the biggest in the US, the US, excuse me, the biggest in the US East Coast, biggest Gulf Coast, biggest in the world, and what about New Orleans? Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Um, no, so because we carry out very uh, detailed, specific uh, simulations for particular locations, we, have, we haven't been able to cover everywhere in the world or even Gulf Coast or uh, East Coast. We, we look for places that uh, possibly have uh, high vulnerabilities. They, they, um, possibly we have extreme events there and the symmetry is shallow. Um, and the population is high, so we look at uh, several places rather than everywhere. Um, so again, we will talk about um, black swans. We, we, we associate them with very, um, the probabilities we estimate. So these black swans we identify for different places, they have different probabilities. So when we compare them, we also have to talk about that. Um, so the question is, we don't know the, the highest for US or for the world. We only know for certain places that we studied. Uh, Harvey Lyford, Freelance. Uh, this is for Professor McNamara. I'm really a little confused about the predictions of abandonment of beachfront property. Uh, in the case of Sandy, as in some other events in the past, homes are destroyed, they're abandoned immediately uh, on, the, on the event. But you're talking, I think, about the incremental decisions over a long period of time as various storms have hit or whatever. And I'm wondering how you isolate the effect of the storm, of the storms, from all other factors that might go in to somebody deciding to stay or abandon a property on the beach, because it it certainly isn't only that. It has to do perhaps with insurance rates, which would be related, mm -hmm. uh, taxes, all mm -hmm. kinds of other mm -hmm. things would mm -hmm. go into it. So how do you focus in on the effect of these storms? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's certainly not clear when you see something that when I speak about the model for five minutes, it, it's not clear. But when we construct those models and put in all the economic sort of calculations that go on in that particular case that drive these decisions about buying coastal property. Um, there are certain things that economists term external costs that uh, we don't necessarily, th there's, not ve there's not a very clear way how to get those things inside of a, a traditional economics decision. Um, but the things that you mentioned, taxes, uh, insurance rates, those kinds of things are wrapped into those decisions. So that when the model unfolds, storms like Sandy do occur, and there's massive destruction in the model, but they rebuild because there is uh, economic incentive still in the market. There's value still in those locations, so they do come back. 
Um, and we can sort of investigate things like what role insurance rates play. And you, you, they, they do what you think they, they probably would do. They, um, they incentivize people to come back into those locations, at least in our first pass of those kinds of simulations. Um, but after a number of these storms, the abandonment that occurs that I, that I was pointing out is abandonment after having suffered storms and eventually the cost to mitigate those shorelines, to continue to nourish the beach and fight erosion, the cost to maintain the dunes, does not out, and, the, and the potential damages that are going to occur in the lifetime of owning the property, those things are not outweighed by the economic incentives for owning that property, like rental rates and things like that. So abandonment is the decision that there's negative property value at that moment in time, economically. Um, and there's, there's some precedent for that, you know, that not necessarily in modern resort barrier island locations, but there are examples of societies that have abandoned coastal locations. Diamond City, North Carolina is a pretty classic one. There was a small community that existed on a portion of a barrier island in North Carolina that after a couple storms, they all decided to pack up and leave, and that town is now abandoned, and nobody lives there. Um, so that's, that's sort of the idea. Uh, Larry O'Hanlon with Discovery News. So my question is for Hillary Stockton. I just want to make sure I understood. I mean, uh, what was the scope of the study you did? Was it just a few spots? I mean, is it kind of proof of concept that this works? I, I just wasn't clear on the... Of the okay. predictions? Yeah. So we are doing that for the entire um, Gulf Coast. It's been done for generalized category one through five hurricanes. And we have recently completed the Southeast Atlantic Coast and are now working on the, the Mid-Atlantic. So it's a large area and the intent is to provide coastal managers and emergency response teams guidance on areas that are more vulnerable vulnerable than others. Okay, the, the other question I have, this is a little bit, a little bit crazy question maybe. So I see all the overwash, all the areas that were just built up. Any chances people are gonna to wanna to build on that? <laughs> and just abandon the, the part that's in the front? I can't answer that. <laughs> Who owns it? Is it just public land? <laughs> well, uh, um, as you saw in maybe some of the photographs right after the storm made landfall, the large overwash fans that were deposited in the streets they were bulldozing that immediately to get the community running again. And so where that sand goes, that's usually up to the local government. I just ask because there seems to be a determination. Some people are very determined to, to build and live in these areas. I just wonder as new land, as it moves you know, towards the mainland, yeah. that, that's stable at least a little longer than the, f the front of it, right? So Move the community with the island. Um, this is uh, back to Black Swans. Uh, you mentioned Darwin, Australia also. Can you talk a, a little bit about um, uh, that region and what you, why you picked it and what you found there? Right. So for Darwin, um, it had, um, so again, the place, um, the water around Darwin is uh, shallow and hot. That's uh, the place that you expect uh, severe tropical cyclones. And Darwin did experience uh, severe tropical cyclones, um, tropical treacy. Uh, was uh, uh, devastated the city, um, but uh, Tracy was a compact storm, so the storm surge was only 1.6 meters. So the city was rebuilt for to resist strong winds, but maybe not for st storm surges. But we found that um, if the strong hurricanes also have large sizes, they can produce extreme surges at Darwin. Um, so. In our simulations, we do got uh, extremes um, up to 10 meters for Darwin. Oh, again, very, very low probabilities, one over um, 20 or 30 thousand years, something like that. Uh, Steve Benko, Physics Today, and back to Overwash and Hillary Stockman. Um, I have a question about the process of Overwash. So during Sandy, of course, it was very dramatic. You showed some very dramatic sand shifting on Assateague Island and Long Island, for, exact, for example. Now, I've, I've heard, I think, for a long time that barrier islands 
replenish their sand and, and move it from front to back repeatedly. But is that only during storms? In other words, is this the dominant process for that sort of evolution of barrier islands? And then the natural follow-up question is, are these islands actually migrating into the mainland, or are they just staying in place and recycling the sand? They are migrating, and, and they do that in rising seas. If you, you can think about barrier islands have a, a water depth that they prefer to be in. And so as sea levels rise, they want to move to higher ground, and that's inland. Now, the process of overwash only happens in extreme storms when the water levels are high enough for waves to overtop the highest point of the island and then transport sand inland. In a typical storm, when waves are confined to the beach face, the sand that's eroded off of the beach moves offshore and is stored in a sandbar. And then during calmer periods, gentle waves will bring the sand back onto the beach face. So you really do need the combination of high water, high water levels and large waves to get sand to move inland. There's a follow-up question from Seth Borenstein with the Associated Press from the internet uh, for Dr. Lynn. So what would be the black swan uh, surge number for New Orleans and any other city that you could give in the US? Um, could you give us another number for another city, any city? Um, we haven't do any analysis for New Orleans um, because storm surge simulation with um, high resolution are extremely computational intensive. So we only have done New York City and Tampa um, for a very large number of simulations at this point for US. Hi, this is Becky Oscar again. Uh, my question is, so why do these black swan cyclones happen? Are they going to be happening more frequently or are they even occurring at all because of climate change, global warming? Why are you guys looking at this and trying to predict that they're going to be happening at all? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there's still on debate about uh, the relationship, uh, the impact of climate change on tropical cyclones. But uh, uh, most uh, studies show that um, the, the intensity of tropical cyclones tend to increase um, on the um, impact of climate change. So once the intensity increases, the storm surge will increase too. So um, we do, uh, some models predict that um, um, the storm surge levels will increase or the black swans will become more often. By often, still very low probabilities. <laughs> So some saying decrease means the, the, the frequency of total storms will decrease. But, um, but when we talk about black swans, we'll talk about extreme of extremes. So um, even though the total number will decrease, the fraction of extremes may increase. Uh, an open question. If I can ask uh, the panel just to pull back a little bit. You, you're all kind of using Sandy, it looks like, to validate some pre-existing research. So it was a good event for that for you folks. But if you could look, look a little bit more globally and, and kind of give me a sense or give us a sense of how Sandy might impact the research that you're doing or the scientific community as a whole has been doing. Is it shifting at all the way you approach your research? Um, is it adding any new dynamics, any new kind of intellectual curiosities? Or is it really just piling on, kind of overwashing what you already know and what you've already been doing? And that's an open question. So Sandy well, has a watershed event for the research community in this discipline. I'm the, sorry, David Hirsch from NHK. For us, it, for, at USGS, because it impacted such a large geographic extent, we are collecting data from North Carolina through Massachusetts. It's really providing us a great opportunity to ground truth our models and see areas where we got it wrong. And we know one direction that we need to head, and that's looking at the duration of the storm. Because currently, we are modeling a time variable process with a single snapshot in time. One snapshot of what the beach looks like, and then, um, or the beach morphology, and then 
what water levels do we expect during the storm. But with Sandy, the beaches were hit by large waves for several tidal cycles. And with each high tide, those dunes experienced more and more overwash. So to include um, how the beach profile changes during the storm and how the vulnerability of a coastline can also change during a storm is an important research direction. I think um, beyond the research community, the storm has just uh, opened up the conversation of beaches changing during storms and brought in a lot of different players to participate in the conversation. Yeah, I, I think in terms of, um, well, first, out of, the, out of the research community, even in the general public and the people's attention, uh, people generally think um, um, Gulf of Mexico uh, would be more vulnerable to uh, tropical cyclones, so maybe uh, less, um, uh, less attention was paid to um, New York City or um, East Coast. But uh, Sandy um, shows that uh, East Coast cities are highly vulnerable, so, um, and the storms uh, can get uh, very nasty in these areas. Um, we published paper in 2010, particularly talking about New York City storm surge risk, and 2012 also uh, for New York City surge risk. So for us, it's a it's also a very good validation of our prediction and uh, hope uh, get people's attention to really um, um, pay attention to such large cities along the coast. Um, for scientific communities, there are a lot of new questions. Uh, Sandy was not a typical hurricane. So it's actually a hybrid storm. It's a combination of tropical storms and extratropical storms. So such storms haven't been well uh, studied. Uh, e uh, even in scientific community, um, risk analysis or uh, prediction of um, risk mitigation. So uh, in the future, I think uh, it's going to be a, a direction to study um, in the scientific community. Yeah. I, I would say for me, there's a sense of it that, that validated some of the work that I have done before um, that suggested that these kinds of systems that are characterized by significant human influences, New Orleans, uh, coastal towns up and down the East Coast, Often the effect of humans in those systems is to decrease the role that small to intermediate size events play in those systems. They effectively filter them out by nourishing and building dunes up at the coastline, for example. So that filters out the effect of those, kind, those size storms with respect to overwash, for example. Overwash that might otherwise happen in an intermediate scale storm then does not happen. And what my research had showed before was that when that occurs, that filtering occurs, what it leads to is that when the large events do come, they're much worse and have much more of a of dramatic impact than they otherwise would have. Katrina was an example of that, and I think Sandy is an example of that as well. Um, so if, in that sense, to me, it validates that, that kind of thinking that when you filter systems, when the big event comes, there's, there's, there's significant changes. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions, and we have one waiting on the internet. Uh, this is another question from Willie Dry from National Geographic News. Does anyone care to make a guess about whether we're likely to see another storm similar to Sandy in the foreseeable future? Is New York City likely to see a similar storm in the foreseeable future? It's for me. Any, anyone who would like to answer? That, that, that's sort of, that, that's a little, I don't feel comfortable answering that. It's a bit open-ended. I mean, foreseeable future is, is yeah. kind of tough to put your finger on. I, I, like I was just saying, I don't necessarily view these situations generally as being that surprising. Um, I, it's no more surprising than, than, than you, the likelihood of me getting a, a strong flu this winter or something like that. I mean, right. it doesn't happen every day, and we kind of tend to not be used to it. But these systems where human beings alter the disturbance regime, they seem to be characterized by these large events. And we see it in other places. It's hard to imagine that it will stop. I, I feel confident saying it's not going to stop. And we should also uh, point out that this has happened in the Gulf of Mexico several times, three times at least in the last decade with Hurricanes Katrina, Ivan, and Ike. And the 
devastation along those coastlines and the amount of change we saw was very similar to what was experienced during Sandy. David Hirsch, NHK. Um, sorry, I have to go to another building to give a presentation. And I, I think as a final question, just for Dr. McNamara, if I could. Sure. To what extent, if at all, is your research transferable to uh, other communities? For instance, communities like that aren't necessarily coastal beach communities, but a place like New Orleans, where the government is actively engaged in building flood protections, mm -hmm. or in other areas, maybe in the Pacific, they might have areas that, that get kind of unique uh, flood or water protections. That obviously, it wouldn't be directly equivalent, but to what extent could we say that these bubbles exist throughout the country in, in different types of communities? Um, the, the bubble part I haven't investigated as much. The, the idea of filtering of small events leading to big, large events, um, I have explored that with, with New Orleans and Katrina. Um, and I spoke actually at, at AGU the year of Katrina, kind of describing that same idea that the, the message there was that these systems, similar to the coastline, are characterized by a steady state that is one where you have periods of quiescence punctuated by really dramatic damage events um, and, and significant amounts of change in these systems. And that seems to be the case at the coastline from the research I've done, and it seems to be the case in New Orleans. Um, I'd, I'd be interested in exploring this in other systems. I think there's potential for it to be applicable in other systems. Okay, that concludes our press conference for today. Our, our press conferences for today. Uh, thank you, panelists, for speaking. And thanks, everyone else, for being here and asking good questions. We have, uh, we'll start again tomorrow morning with press conferences at 8 a.m. Our first one is called New Findings, New Enigmas. NASA's Van Allen Van Allen probes begin their ex exploration of the radiation belts. And we'll look forward to your being here then. <laughs>